say God's design for your life is the best design for your life. You know, all of the pain and hurt and things that we deal with in life, the issues that we wrestle with over and over again, they're all a result of us rejecting God's design and us choosing our desire. As a matter of fact, that's kind of the narrative of history. It started at the very beginning. God has this angel that he named Lucifer. He had a design for his life, and Lucifer said, guess what? I prefer my desire over your design. We now know him as Satan, and he no longer lives in heaven. Then God places man and woman in a garden, perfect environment, and guess what? They choose their desire over God's design. They are kicked out of the garden, and now sin is released into the world, and everything that we experience that is negative is because of that one decision for them to choose their desire over God's design. But God's design for your life is the best design for your life. Last week, we started a series called Riddle Me This. It's the cautionary tale of Samson. How many of y'all are familiar with the story of Samson in Scripture? Samson was an incredible human being. He had incredible strength, but he had terrible patterns. Amazing potential, but terrible patterns. And he ended up losing everything because he continuously chose his desire over God's design. Today, we're going to revisit his story in Judges, the 16th chapter. We'll start reading in verse 4. And I don't care if this is the 1,000th time that you've heard the story of Samson and Delilah. I want you to dig into this text and read it along with me. Follow along on the screens because there are some important details that we need to pull out of it. You know, Ms. Strickland, sometimes it's easy for us to get so familiar with the stories of Scripture that we miss what's actually happening in Scripture. But today, I, I want us to dive in. God, what is it that you want us to see from this text? So let's, let, let's go. Y'all ready? Judges 16, starting verse 4. The Bible says, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Surak, whose name was, everybody say it, Delilah. So here's what I want you to notice. Samson loved Delilah. This is more than just a physical connection. Many times we look at the story and we make it all about temptation and physical things, but this is like an emotional investment. Samson loves this girl, and her name is what? Delilah. Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up to her her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies and how you might be bound. I want to know how to weaken you so that you can be bound. Get this. Where is your great strength lie? How can you be subdued? And Samson said to her, well... If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings. As a thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire, so the secret of his strength was not known. You didn't get me. I'm all good. Let's go on to verse 10. Then Delilah said to Samson, turn to the person next to you and say, Delilah had a lot to say. (laughs) Then Delilah said to Samson, behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. Red flag. Okay? Like, if you're not catching along so far, like, this is bad news. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, well, if they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, the Philistines are upon you. And the men lying in ambush bush were in the inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. No big deal. It's all good. 
Verse 13, Delilah said to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head with the web and fasten it tight with the pen, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into the web. And she made them tight with the pen and said to him, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pen, the loom, and the web. No big deal. It's all good. I'm all right. I can handle this. Are you following so far? But then she says, how can you say that you love me? You're toying with a girl's heart. How can you say that you love me and that your heart is with me? This is what Samson's telling her. Delilah, I love you, girl. You're my boo thing. This heart belongs to you. And then, you know, boy band in the background. I mean, this is like a romantic, but, but how, how can you tell me? How can you say that you love me and that your heart is with me, but you mock me these three times and you have not told me where your strength lies? And when she pressed him hard with her words, day after day, and urged him, his soul was vexed to death, and he told her his heart, and he said to her, Here's the deal, a razor has never come upon my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's room. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she called the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her, and she brought they brought the money in their hands, and she made him sleep on her knees. She made him take a nap in her lap. And she called the man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength, what happened? It left him. And she said to the Philistines that are upon you, Samson, and he woke from his sleep, and he says, I'm going to go out there just like every other time. I'm going to shake myself. We're going to get it on. But this time, something changed. He did not know that the Lord had left him. And the Philistines seized him. They gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground up the middle of the prison. We're talking about a superhero. Samson was incredible. Now he is forced to do slave labor, labor for his enemy. That's an important detail. He, he used to be in charge. He used to be in control. He used to have some strip, but now he's lost his sight. He has no vision. He has no vision for where he's going. He has no vision for who, who is it that God's even called me to be. I, I remember a time that God spoke and said, I'm going to raise you up. You're going to be a judge in Israel. But now I've gotten to a point where I can no longer see that. I no longer see myself as who God has called me to be because I've been blinded. Now I've lost my freedom. And the thing that I was meant to conquer is now conquering me. Whew, that's a powerful thought right there. The thing I was created to destroy is now destroying me. The thing that God wanted to place under my feet is now standing on my head. I feel God in this place, and I feel like preaching a little bit, if that's okay. Now go to Luke 14, 28. We're going to get one more verse, and then we're going to hop right in. For which of you, this is Jesus speaking, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and say it with me. What do they do? Count the cost. Which of you, if you're going to build something, you don't first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it. Jesus right here, he's talking about the cost of following him. He's saying like, all of you people, like you're wanting to say, hey, Jesus, I'm with you, but before you make this decision, I want you to consider the cost. That, that's, the, that's the context of Luke 14, 28. But the principle of counting the cost is the same everywhere. You, you should never enter into anything 
without first considering what is this going to cost me or where is this going to take me? I want to say that again. Don't ever get involved with anything or anyone without first saying, what is this going to cost me and where could it end up taking me? Because remember, decisions lead to what? Destinations. Your decisions are taking you somewhere. So wisdom is this. Here's, here's a little bit of wisdom. Wisdom says, I'm going to look at this thing before I step into it to consider where it could end up taking me. Because it may feel good for the moment. It may look good for the moment. But I want to count the cost of where, what's this thing going to end like. Because I want to make sure when the bill comes, I got enough to handle it. And how many of you know the bill always comes? Always. Unless y'all see me eating in a restaurant and you decide, you know, I'm a bypasser as lunch. But the bill still came. It just came to you, which is much better. I like that plan. But, you know, sometimes there's even like there's hidden costs that we're not aware of in certain things. Like if you go to a, a place to buy a car, there's the sticker price. And then there's a price that you get when you walk out of the finance office. Big difference. So sometimes like we need to count the cost of like the fact that, okay, there are some, there are some signs and and things that are saying this could go in this direction. I'm going to count that cost, but I also need to be aware that sometimes there's some hidden costs. Sometimes there's some hidden agendas that I'm not even aware of in the natural, and I really need to lean on the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of me to give me wisdom for that moment so that he can help me count the cost. Isn't that wonderful that the Spirit of God himself will help you count the cost? You don't have to do it on your own, which is great news for me because I'm terrible at math. I mean, I I was like in low math. So, like, having God on my side helping me do stuff is, like, really, really great news. The problem with Samson is this. He had never been beaten. He did not know what it was like to meet a challenge that he couldn't handle. So, when Delilah comes by, she ain't no thing. She's toying with me, but it's okay. I'm in charge. I can handle this because I I don't know what it's like to be beaten. And so now what happens is he gets sloppy. He lets his guard down. And he doesn't count the cost of laying his head in the wrong lap. The question I want to ask today that I really want you to think about is this. What lap or whose lap are you laying in? Who or what are you surrounding yourself with? Now, this is the time for you to think about you. Don't think about your husband. Don't think about your wife. Don't think about your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your kids. Don't don't worry about the laps there. And today, I want you to think, who or what am I finding rest in? And this can be anything. See, for Samson, it was a relationship. He was trying to fulfill a need that was really there by connecting himself to different kinds of people. But the lap that we lay in could be anything. I mean, it can be an environment that we surround ourselves with. It could be a way of thinking, which is huge. How many of you know sometimes we just don't think right? We have the wrong thought process, and it takes us down the wrong path. So it could be a way of thinking. It could be a habit. Or it could even be a hobby. Anything, anything that I continually go back to to find comfort in becomes the lap that I'm laying in. But here's what you need to know about the wrong lap. The wrong lap will comfort you. It will deceive you. It will expose you. And then it will finally strip you. It will comfort you. It will deceive you. It will expose you. And then before it's all said and done, it will strip you. That's what I want to look at today. Because Samson found comfort in Delilah. Says he loved her. There's a connection here. But here's what you need to know. Even though it comforts you, it's comfort's counterfeit. My brother got married last year. And he decided, I'm going to go get a uh, custom-tailored jacket made for my wedding. Like, this is a big day. I want to go get, 
I don't want to just like go to the store and buy any old jacket that anybody could wear. I want this thing to be the color, the material, and the cut that I want. And if you know anything about suit jackets, you need to make sure that it was cut for you and not just for anyone, right? I mean, this is a big day. It's your wedding. So what he does is he finds this website. <laughs> and it looked really good. I mean, whoever put this website together, they were pros. They had all the material lists on there that you could go through. You could find the different designs, the different patterns, the different kinds of cuts. I mean, nice, nice material. And then they had like models on there showing you what it was going to look like on you, which I have found never works. Like I used to try shopping based upon the mannequin in the mall because I'd be like, that looks good. I get it home. Does not look the same on me as the mannequin. But anyway, so my brother goes through the process. He orders this custom cut jacket. And he's excited about it. He's telling everybody about it. He even photoshopped. Listen to this. <laughs> he took a picture of where the wedding venue was going to be, and he photoshopped the groomsmen and the bridesmaids into this thing, and then he put himself wearing the jacket he's about to get. <laughs> Boy was obsessed with this jacket. He was going to be amazing. Two weeks before the wedding, it's no jacket. Now it's crunch time. But the jacket shows up, which is amazing news. The terrible news is when he takes it out of the pocket, it's not what he expected it to be. It, not only was it not custom tailored for his body, it was not custom tailored for anyone. The pocket that should have been here was like under the armpit. <laughs> this nice, beautiful material that he had ordered was this like really cheap fabric. It looked like if you were to go to the party store today and you were like, you know what, Halloween's coming up, I want to be a mafia boss. I'm going to go get my mafia suit from the party store. That's what this jacket looked like. Here's what I'm trying to say. It's like, it comforts, but the comfort's counterfeit. It looks really good. It looks like the real thing, but it is not. Samson really loved Delilah. That was like a real feeling he had. His feelings for her were genuine, but her comfort for him was counterfeit. We're always going to get trapped in this one if we do not understand who Christ is and what he's done and who he wants to be inside of you. Because we're always going to look for a temporary situation to fix a need or a desire that we have in our life. We'll do it every time. And the, the problem is, it looks really good, right? So we'll chase after it, we get it, and guess what? It feels good. Like the thing that we were looking for, like once we get it, it feels good, but then the new wears off. It doesn't last because everything in this world is transient. That means it's, it's temporary. So it looks good, but it really isn't. It's a counterfeit. Everything that God has created for you, Satan has a counterfeit. Did you know that? That's why some of you will, when you're watching the Super Bowl today, you'll be like, yeah, yeah. And then you'll come into church when you're singing about Jesus dying for you, and you're like. Because you've bought into counterfeit worship. Don't like to hear that, do you? We'll move on to the next point. It deceives. It makes you think it is good even when it is not good at all. And the reason the deception works is because on the surface, some of the things that we go after are not evil in and of itself. So there are things that we go to to satisfy different needs and desires that we have that like that in and of itself is not a sin or it's not evil. For instance, like shopping. Any ladies out there like retail therapy? Is shopping evil? <laughs> I heard a prophetess in the building. <laughs> shopping is not evil. But what if I spend so much money that it becomes a financial strain on my family and now it's causing stress in my marriage? Is shopping good? No. It's become something that is damaging my life. Men, like any hunters and fishermen out there, like you like to hunt and fish, is it good or bad? Good, right? 
it's good to get away. It's good to relax. It's good to do things that you enjoy. But now let's say that I'm spending so much time and money to hunt and to fish that I'm neglecting my family or even the church. I don't have time to be at church. I don't have money to give to church because I'm, I'm doing this. God understands, right? I mean, God understands. God understands that like deer season kicks up from this time to this time. He gets the fact that I'm going to be in the woods and he's cool with that. See, what you've done is you've taken something and you've deceived yourself with it. You're telling yourself that God is okay with something that God never said he's okay with. It's getting quiet. Did we just become a Presbyterian church? <laughs> See, that's the, that's the problem is, in and of itself, it's not evil. And so what we do is we start making excuses and like, it's okay. It's okay to have my kids involved in this kind of stuff. Like, you know, it, God gets it. And it's not really that important that they're at church all the time. When they get a little bit older and things slow down, then they'll get plugged into church. You're deceiving yourself because you're training them to think that God's house is not important. And you can say, well, this is different and I'm different, but you are deceived. It deceives you. It, it in and of itself is not evil. Your kids should be involved in stuff. You should have hobbies. You ha should have things you enjoy, but you cannot allow that to be the God of your life. You cannot allow that to be the thing that controls and drives your life because you are here for more than just getting a job, getting a family, buying a house, and saving up enough money to move to a beach, which is what we call the American dream, and we think that God's okay with that, and he's not. You've deceived yourself. You were created for a purpose. You were designed for a specific function, and the Spirit of God fills you to empower you, but the gifts that you need to become who you have been called to be comes from the church where God has placed the gifts to equip you for the work. Did you know that? No, buddy, I can find God on a fishing boat by myself. <laughs> I'm going to give you one. You can. You can find God on a fishing boat all by yourself. Because you can, that's the beautiful thing about God. I can cry out to God anywhere, anytime, any moment. I don't have to go to this place or that place to find God. I, because of Jesus Christ, can meet with God. But I tell you what happens when I get out on the boat. And God shows up. Things are going to start changing in my life. And I'm going to get excited about what he's done for me. And so now i got to go tell Bob, Bob, you got to come out on the boat with me and meet Jesus. And you're going to come out there with me, and we're going to seek Jesus together. And then Bob's going to get excited, and we got to go tell the world. we got to tell the world. And so now we're going to have so many people on this boat that we got to buy a bigger boat. And then we can't contain them on the boat, so we're going to move to dry land. But then the county steps in and says, you can't have this many people on land. It's a disturbance. And so now we have to do what everyone hates, take up an offering and build a building so we can have a church. You know why? Because I met with God all by myself and God showed me that I have a purpose and a destiny for my life. So stop making excuses. You are deceived. And it's okay. I've been deceived before and it's possible that I'll get deceived again. I mean, this is something that we all wrestle with, but we need to be aware of the way we're thinking because sometimes we're finding our rest in the wrong way of thinking and we're saying this is what God is for and God is saying, where'd you see that? Well, God's okay with this. Where'd you see that? Well, God understands. Where'd you see that? Well, he knows my situation. Where'd you see that? Like if you got a legit like Bible verse to go along with this stuff, then, then yeah, walk it out. But don't become your own God and determine your own course for life because that ends badly. It comforts, but it's counterfeit. It deceives. And then it exposes our weakness to diminish our strength. This, this happens a lot within relationships, and this could be the kind of lap that this would pertain to. The, the relationship is only really interested in our weakness and not our strength. So sometimes you'll find somebody who's like jacked up in their mind and they'll find somebody who's super insecure and they'll hook up and this person feeds on this person's weakness which in then return feeds 
this person's weakness. And a lot of times, relationships or even friendships are built on our weakness. Like, you like doing this and I like doing that, so why don't we get together and do that together? But if I decide I'm going to change my life, and maybe some of you have dealt with this, like you gave your life to Christ and you're like, you know what, I don't need to run with that crowd anymore. How many of you found that they're not real excited about your decision? You know why? Because it was your weakness that benefited them. It was your insecurity that benefited them. It was the stuff that you did on the weekend that gave them a good laugh. So they're not interested in your strength. They want to keep you weak because that's where they benefit. They benefit off of your weakness. And so if you have somebody in your life, hear what I'm saying? If you have someone in your life that is continually strengthening your weakness, they are not a friend. They are an enemy. If somebody is always pulling you in the wrong direction, they are not a friend. They are an enemy. It doesn't mean that they're an evil person. They may not even be aware of it. But I've got to realize if I want to step into something new, then I've got to change some things around me. So I can love you, I can be kind to you, but I can no longer give my life to you because if you're a real friend, you're going to push me into my strength. See, Delilah did not care anything about Samson's strength. All she cared about was his weakness because that's what's going to get her paid. See, a good, solid relationship would have been somebody who says, Samson, I know you got weakness, but I want to cover that weakness so that you can walk in your strength. I want to remind you, Samson, you are called of God. You've got a purpose on your life. You've got to keep your focus, Samson. You've got to keep your eyes fixed because God wants to use you and do incredible things. Those are the kind of relationships we need to be around. And if you're in a friendship scenario like Be that friend. Be that friend that encourages someone's strength, encourages their purpose and the gifts to come out to be used by God. That's what we need. We need people who are encouraging us and not exposing our weakness for our strength. Delilah comforted Samson. He loved her. She deceived him. She exposed the secret of his weakness. She did it. And then she stripped him. God's design for Samson was to be a champion. And it ends with him in slavery. God's design for Samson's life was better than Samson's design for his life, but he had to learn that the hard way. How many of us, we have to learn the hard way? We go to Delilah the first time, she says, show me your weakness. We mess around a little bit with it. We think we're okay. This isn't gonna get me, I can handle this. So we come back a second time. She wants to talk about our weakness, but we walk away, we're okay. Third time, same thing. How, how, do you, how do you become weak? And we toy with it and we play with it. But the fourth time he comes back and this time she got him. This time she was able to strip every aspect of his life because he kept on going back. How many times are we going to keep on going back before we understand that God, your design for my life is the best design. We mess it up. From the very beginning, people have been messing this thing up. We've been choosing our desire over your design, but you sent your son. He died on a cross so that we could be pulled back into the design. He was broken so that we could be put back together. His image and identity was destroyed so that we could find our image and our identity. He did all that for me. Why? So that I could get back to the design for which I was created. To start walking on top of the things that have been walking on top of me for years. All of the sin belongs under my feet. Every problem belongs under my feet. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. I am more than a conqueror. I've got some strength. I've got some strength. And the beautiful thing about Jesus is, no matter how far we go, he gives us an opportunity to say, I need my strength back. Because Samson's hair starts growing. (laughs) 
It starts growing again. It gets the strength back. And we see the mercy of God. That's what I want for every person in this place is what's best for you. I want to see you walk in health. I want to see you walk in strength. I want to see you be at perfect peace. I want you to have the joy of the Lord in abundance. If you were blessed with a billion dollars today, I would celebrate that. I want what is best for you. But what is best for you only comes from his design. Every other source is counterfeit. You know, we have basic needs, like we're looking for love, but we go to the wrong person. We're looking to be accepted, but we go to the wrong place or the wrong thing and get involved with the wrong crowd and we lower our moral standards or we, we want this security in our life. We want this peace in our life, so we go to the wrong source, the wrong substance. We're, we're trying to fulfill legitimate needs. These are all things that we need but we're going to illegitimate sources. And God says, I'm the source. Jesus, Jesus illustrates this beautifully in John 4 when he goes to the woman at the well. She comes and she's like getting some water. He tells her, he says, you know what? If you drink of this water, you're gonna get thirsty again. Did y'all know that? Like the water you drink is not gonna last forever. I mean, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna take a sip right now. I needed that. You, all through the sermon, I'm taking a sip of water. After I drink it, I'm not thirsty anymore. But then as I talk and I go about, I get thirsty again. So what do I got to do? I got to go back to the water. That's what Jesus is telling this lady about the well. If, you, if you're thirsty and you keep on drinking of this well, you're going to get thirsty again. He said, but if you drink of what I've got, you'll never thirst again. And she's like, well, tell me about this. And he says, go get your husband. Now watch this. Jesus is going to start messing with her business. Go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. I've had four husbands. But the man I'm with now, the fifth guy, we're not married. Jesus tells her that. He says, he says you've, you've said right that you have no husband. You've actually had four husbands and the man you're living with right now is not your husband. And he hits the nail on the head. He's saying there's something in you that is broken and missing and thirsting and you think you're going to find the solution in a relationship. But the newness of that relationship wears off and you got to get another relationship, so on and so forth. And that's what happens with the lap. We keep on coming back for a temporary fix, but it does not last. And Jesus says, if you'll drink of me, if you'll partake of me, if you'll get a hold of what I've got to offer you, you'll find ultimate satisfaction. In him is joy. In him is peace. In him is every good gift that I need, and it's available to me, but it is through him. He is the door. He is the access point to the kingdom of God where all of this stuff comes from. If you're watching online today, and you're, you're hearing this, and you're like, man, I've never really thought about that, and I, I can see now that my life's been a constant shifting from this to that, just trying to find some security or belonging or love or acceptance. Today, I challenge you to come to Christ, to give him your life fully and completely. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for everybody that's watching or listening by podcast, and we ask that you would touch them, Lord. We ask that you would move in their heart and in their life. In Jesus' name, amen.